Um, I mean, I've had a lot of friends, people who are gra graduating from university, who in order to pay their student debt, then went to either Korea or China to become like English second language uh, teachers. In many cases, like, so there's like, you know, like hundreds and thousands of young graduates doing that as like, you know, get, get graduate from university, but untrained in um, uh, language education. And uh, so I know many of those, uh, many people who did that, but one in particular struck me, one of my friends who basically quit and left because he felt that somewhat this had turned him into a missionary, a more global missionary, or at the very least he felt like he was basically becoming a contributor to a, a um, capitalist, also a colonial uh, model in which like, you know, uh, language just became, uh, the, the transnational movement of language just became, you know, turning language into some forms of like capital. So I know it's like a very different context on the, the specific ESL context you're talking about, but I was wondering if any of you had like think about what thoughts about this, because I would have loved to have this friend of mine now meet him again and, and I didn't expand on his thoughts about this, but maybe there's something that you've encountered or thought about in this context. Well, I mean, I can, I mean, I can answer that question with personal experience. I lived, I, I did that. I lived and taught English in Japan for a number of years with no experience as a teacher, no training as a teacher. And where I was in Japan, Okinawa, has a, a complex relationship with Japan and with the English language because of the American military there. And the whole time I was working there, at first in the private sector and then in the public sector, I was always kind of uncomfortable about my position as a sort of proselytizer of the English language. And it was only when I returned to Canada for professional development that I discovered that I could study these things. And that's kind of what brought me to the kind of conversation that, that, I, that I was bringing here today. Okay, yeah, I really enjoyed all the talks. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, I have a question specifically for Andrea. I don't know if you want to answer this later or if now would be a good time, but I was really intrigued when you started talking about uh, narrative methodologies in teaching, and especially through hope. And it made me think of some theory texts I've been reading lately in affect theory and queer theory, and there's been sort of a movement away from focusing on emotions like shame, anxiety, loneliness to more positive emotions, but critically engaging them. So uh, Sarah Med has a really good book on happiness. Lauren Berlot wrote one on optimism, but they're very high theoretical. They're not actually practical applications of how these affective states can function. So I'm sort of curious if you could expand a bit about um, how hope works in your classrooms or through your research and like sort of a pedagogy of hope or how that was deployed throughout your work because it sounds very interesting. Well, uh, that was um, in fact by chance that I started doing research on hope. As I said, I first went to Canada in 2006 and there I met this uh, researcher from uh, the Hope Foundation of Old Butter. She's in fact a psychologist um, and she works in, in the area of psychology of education in the University of Alberta. So uh, I, I watched her presentation and I thought it was perfect for teacher development. So uh, I started this conversation with her and two other researchers that were doing research on hope in teacher education in Canada. And uh, I tried to apply what, what they were doing at the Hope Foundation of Alberta in my own classroom. So um, at that time I was teaching a course on teacher development. So um, I had uh, about 25 teachers to be in my classroom. And we were mostly reading um, texts on how teacher development is um, was was being done in Brazil uh, and also abroad. So I introduced um, these questions of hope. Uh, we discussed things like how do you find hope in your profession? What makes you want to be uh, a language teacher or an English teacher in the fu future? And also <coughs> Uh, when we finished the course, this was kind of a very reflective course, so I didn't want to, to, to give a test at the end because it made no sense for me, at, at least. So I, I had kind of 
some questions and three of these questions were on hope asking them exactly these things how do you find hope in your profession what makes you more or less hopeful in depending on the situations you you encounter and what kind of people um, inspire hope in you or in what you do and how do you think your own work will inspire hope in, in others, in your students for example. And 18 students, um, there were other questions and they could choose which ones to answer. So 18 students answered, decided to answer the questions on hope and that's how I, 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 I got the stories of hope and hopelessness and there were other stories like um, things that are hopeless in the beginning make you more hope, may make you more hopeful um, if you sort of change the perspective. Unfortunately, this kind of research that I did was not very critical. Uh, it was more descriptive. Um, and as I said, one of the things that made me publish only in English was because the word hope in Portuguese is very, um, how can I say, it's not very active, it's a very passive word, word and has to do with weight. Okay. The same, it's the same words that we, that we use for hope, it, we also use the same verb as, it, it, it also means weight. So it's kind of a passive, a very passive attitude. And because I didn't know how to translate that in, into a more, more active concept, I decided only to publish in English. But um, yeah, there, there have been developments and at least one other researcher that I know of is doing her uh, PhD, uh, she did her master's in, in, with this idea of hope and she's now going on to her PhD studies and she translated as a, a hopeful attitude. So it made it more, more active, a more active concept. But again, it's not very critical. I might uh, find ways to turn into a, a, a more critical kind of research in the future. Sounds good, thank you. Okay. And, uh, I think we could follow on with that train for quite a way, but um, I'll let Limerio have the next question before we break. The, we're talking about borders, and I'm, I'm on this side of the border, should I say south of the border. That doesn't sound too good for the Canadians, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Brian and uh, Jonathan both mentioned the epistemological issues, and Hubert Wall as well. Uh, but reading, reading Jonathan's presentation and Brian's presentation from a Brazilian perspective, and taking into account the the issue, the epistemic issues. Brian mentioned uh, uh, the Lajo, uh, what, what was it called, the Declaration of Agreement, and also Kumara uh, Vadivelo's or her woman. Kumara uh, Vadivelo. His, uh, his idea, uh, which I think he inherits from post-colonial theory and the, the whole concept of othering and self-othering and self-marginalization. I see them, from a Brazilian perspective, I see them as in, in blatant contradiction, uh, because if the Lavo Agreement talks about refers to UNESCO and human rights, that's already a very Eurocentric idea. Right? And then we, we come to the self-othering. It's exactly the whole process of human rights and, and humanism, which othered uh, uh, the non-West. Right? Uh, I don't know if those issues were. Was, no, I, I wonder what you may. You may have to say on that, but uh, uh, with Jonathan, it's also, there's also a presupposition involved that where I think uh, it, you may not be aware of this, but we are very much aware. You, you spoke of ethnography, uh, but not the ethnography of English, where you, all, you spoke of English in the plural, in the singular, right? And I wonder if you're presupposing things that Brian mentioned already when he, in the criticism that Kumar Vodavelo makes of English which is a presupposition of the native speaker in English, right? but as if English is the, is, the lang is the singular language of a particular community. Right? Uh, for us, we have other presuppositions in relation to that. Yeah? Um, so these are the two epistemological issues that 
from us, from a different epistemological stance, we would read those things in different ways. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a good point. Um, one of the problems in the declaration, and I think it does maybe relate back to the UNESCO declaration, it, it's only really said at the beginning, is the issue of language sciences itself, because especially working with so many indigenous scholars, there's no questioning what do we mean by science, whose science, who gets to make it, what are the conditions in which we recognize science as the arbiter of decisions around language and community. So there said there are a number of these kinds of contradictions in the document. That's why, in particular, I really like the one that I bolded having the field professionals have the capacity to resist things, including the document, based on where they're working, who they're working with, because um, in a kind of strategic, essentialistic, Spivakian kind of way, there are places where the assertion of science uh, will have the ear of administrators. So, you know, there's, there's playing the game of knowing where you are as, as the teacher to be able to assert, you know, there's, I need to make a claim based on solid research founded in science that we recognize in this community as being authoritative and, and so for that reason I'd like to change the syllabus. So those kinds of issues, you're right, there's a contradiction there and again I think it justifies why we need to enhance the capacities from the bottom up of resisting the documents. Because it's that UNESCO declaration which invented the concept of the mother tongue. Um, yes. 1952 which creates a huge problem for Asia and Africa. Yes. Where it, on the basis of rights, it, it says that other. every every nation, uh, the speaker of any language in any nation has a right to, to education in the mother tongue. So the mother tongue is not defined. It assumes that all yes, nations yes. are monolingual and have single mother tongues. Yeah, and all the rest are secondary yeah. Yeah, addition. Yeah. But again, that was, it was interesting because the assumptions, again, was on the scientific foundations of these kinds of declarations or the uniformity consensus around how we can come to these decisions in organizations like UNESCO. <laughs> so, so if I understand your question correctly, I think you're, I think you're right um, in the sense that in those policy documents and in that kind of national conception of English, um, the, in that top-down way I was describing, is very, is very much a singular English. Um, knowledge and kind of understanding of the plurality of Englishes on the part of students and on the part of their teachers as well. As someone who's worked in uh, EAP for a long time, uh, there's, there's quite a broad range of perceptions of English uh, and Englishes and kind of permission of variation um, from teacher to teacher. Um, that's something that is still incredibly surprising to me that they still kind of exist to this day, but I think it speaks to some of the training and accreditation that's, that's still kind of setting that up. So you're going to do an ethnography of English in Canada? Yes, yeah. Of, of, but it's going to be, a, it would be something of a, to use, to use like Kashru's, uh, like a world English is in Canada, to see how the speakers of these world Englishes, so for example, Portuguese, uh, Brazilian, Brazilian speakers of English, um, engage with English in Canada and how in turn the Canadians that they're that they're engaging with at the universities you know how they set up notions of English in that context. Are you familiar with the uh, work of the Brazilian uh, Radio Kupala? I've seen a few of his articles, yeah. Oh, can I still add yeah, I'll be interested in listening to someone answering Sasha's question in relation to what uh, uh, he referred to self-marginalization. If people do not learn, do not study what is, what is understood as mainstream. You mean the forum? Yeah, the forum, yeah. I, I, do you want a question? If, if I understood correctly, right? Uh, we're talking about uh, critical, critical literacies and critical everything. And uh, to Sergio just inverted the game, asking, asking, I think, you know, uh, whether this is not a proposal. This is not a, doesn't mean it is a proposal that uh, also uh, people feel self-marginalized 
because they do not know what is mainstream, right? We are, we are, uh, let's say, advocating the idea that we are, uh, we should think of local proposals, uh, that we should understand our context, and he is just uh, saying the opposite, right? He's, he wonders about the opposite, right? We talked about this at USP a little bit. Um, uh, you have to, you have to be careful of, of not removing yourself from the discussion. Um, one of the articles we, we circulated was uh, Alistair Pennycook's Praxicum, and one of the, one of the interesting things right there is he was talking about the use of the uh, phrasal verb versus. So, you sh critical work is not a. I, we said I don't believe it's something that is a 24-hour, seven separate syllabus. So you have to choose. I'm either going to be critical or mainstream. It's finding moments and places in the mainstream. In Christian Chung's article, I think, is an excellent example. It's finding moments and places in the mainstream, and there may not be a lot of them, depending on the kind of environment in which you can bring that perspective to it. So in Alistair's case, it's just looking at a vocabulary. Uh, I've, I've looked at things, for example, like teaching pronunciation. That you risk, if you risk removing yourself too far from uh, the, the expectations of the institution, but also from what your students need or expect that, that you are in danger of your right, of no longer having an audience willing to listen to you or respect your decision. So I think that's a key issue. Any of the other speakers like to I, I don't know, but um, following from what Brian said, um, I think that uh, as I work mainly with teacher education, I've found that I've I've, I've seen people, my uh, teachers to be, the teachers that come to my classrooms, teachers to be that come to my classrooms, um, they usually say things like. Uh, <coughs> Some people don't speak proper English. Or when I'm going to do this, this kind of work, this kind of critical work, if, if I'm going to do this kind of critical work, when am I going to teach English? So they think, they think it has to be either or. And they also have very strong beliefs that English, uh, English teaching has to follow a pattern, whatever it is. It, it can't be uh, whatever you want. You have to choose to teach British English or American English or Australian English, but it has to follow a pattern, specifically the native pattern. So I don't know if it's self-marginalization, but um, I think there are um, very uh, several things that we still have to work on with teachers and, and teachers to be. Uh, before we can we can really get to a more critical view on critical on language teacher education. I mean, I, we don't have to wait till we we go through this, these issues. But there are um, and going back to uh, what uh, the other question, the advantages and disadvantages. So may, maybe this is one of the disadvantages that uh, fighting with these strong beliefs that teachers have in terms of what kind of, of English they should be teaching and when and for what purpose um, may be one of the problems in introducing critical literacy in language teacher education. Okay, I have just one point though, because uh, I criticize, you know, the, the mainstream approaches for English language teaching and some would might ask me, so so what do you do with those knowledges? So you don't just don't include them in your syllabus or you just teach critically? I think uh, from the beginning, let's say when I started teaching 10 years ago in the <coughs> BA courses, I started with the evolution of methods, you know, when I, w I work with teacher education and so on. Uh, nowadays I don't start with that, you know, approach anymore, but doesn't mean that I don't have space in my syllabus to approach those those knowledges as well. The idea is that they can, well, they can make choices as well, you know, some of them they may teach in the private sector, for example, and say, this is fine for me. So, you know, I'm not just there to convert them into these theories, but I think uh, we can have a space in the classroom to discuss, the, you know, this, 
So these are some tendencies, or this is something that uh, brings education and language together. But there are these other perspectives. Okay, they bring education as well, but uh, education with another concern, with another uh, perspective. And also uh, answering um, um, your question about the importance of language policy, this is also interesting because most of our language policy, for example, in our state here, is a very mainstream-based notion of knowledge, language, culture, and so on. Um, and I think that uh, the students have to understand the mechanism that they are constructed in these policies, you know, mechanism as Shohami, uh defines as, you know, uh, evaluation, course books, you know, the, the, the ideologies that, you know, are created into these materials. And I think the students need to be critical of these aspects, you know, so this is one of the, um, the importance of uh, working with language policy with these students. Because I think language policy is everywhere, you know, we have policies for PNLD, the, the, the course books nowadays, the Brazilian schools, they, they get the, the course books, the uh, assessments according to some, uh, you know, the, the, the examination to, to the school entrance, to the university entrances, uh, you have national guidelines, uh, state guidelines, so I think all these aspects interfere on the teachers when they go to school in the future. So I think this is my interest in working with language policy with these students. So this is not there, you know. The course book's there, so the, 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 guide, the guidelines are there. So it's not something neutral, you know. There are some things you have to, to discuss with them. You know, both sides, the mainstream and the critical. I was, I was struck uh, who about by your uh, <coughs> description of the high dropout rate in the, the programs, and I was curious about the comparison with Canada. I would suspect it is not as high, not as high in Canada, but I don't know, and I'm wondering if anyone here does know. Um. Yeah. No? <laughs> you don't know, but well, you're... It would be so many different contexts of, yeah. of uh, language structure. So what were the specific contexts again that you were referring to? The, the map they showed was, uh, you know, it's not specifically for English language teaching, it's specific, it is uh, uh, a broad idea of teaching courses, mm -hmm. all the, the, the educational courses like math, science, languages and, and others. So, so it was like teacher education Yes, courses. yeah, in general, yeah. yeah. But I'd be surprised at this comment that um, you asked whether in Canada the, the profession of teaching is seen in as low regard as it is in Brazil. So from that I learned that teaching is seen in low regard in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And secondly, um, if you were to ask if Canadian uh, teachers see themselves, and I'm talking about um, uh, teachers in primary and secondary school, uh, I think nowadays this is seen as a full-fledged, well-paid pr profession, highly desirable. Yes. The faculties of education have long, long lineups of people trying to get in. You have to have more and more qualifications. For example, even going to China for a couple of years and without any background, but with a Bachelor of, um, of Arts can can add, to your, can add to your, your qualifications. So it's very interesting that we're talking about this because um, it's almost the elephant in the room yes. that uh, we haven't really talked about. And that is we're talking about um, <coughs> having a profession slowly enter a world in which they criticize their environment. And it sounds to me, and yet, the majority of them seem to be mainstream. So it, we're almost getting into a Gramscian situation in which people misrecognize their reality. And I wonder whether in uh, teacher education programs, both for English uh, as a second or foreign language, or international language, but even more importantly, for teachers of Portuguese, <coughs> To what extent is awareness of their own professional condition in society brought up 
as a normal, I would say, mainstream characteristic of their entry into the profession. Because all of the points that you've made, um, it's wonderful that we're having to talk about this in English, but the talk about it in English, if it's not set in a context of Brazilian <coughs> Portuguese language education, <coughs> so that is a comment which is probably got a couple of questions in it. But in order to answer Robert Bell's question, I'd say yes, the profession of teaching in general in Canada is more highly prized than apparently it is in Brazil. But Ian, there's, some, there's information missing there. Because one thing is to have, uh, my colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong, one thing, uh, like, uh, teachers in general in, in this country, are, this is a profession of very low regard, and we've seen this recently when we've been compared to doctors. Uh, and uh, teachers haven't even been taken into account in the general population. But uh, given that situation, it's even worse when you talk about English language teachers. We're even lower down the scale. Because yeah? if teachers don't make a contribution to the nation, and that's the, a significant contribution to the nation, and that seems to be the general common sense, then English language teachers make even less of a contribution to the nation. And so maybe it is time um, on that, well, less hopeful or potentially more optimistic note <laughs> uh, to, to go for a break and talk informally about some of these issues and questions we've raised.